Welcome back to Ask Confluent, where we answer questions from the internet. I'm your host, Gwen Shapira, today here alone with no guests. And we have the usual few questions, few comments, lots of fun. So let's get started. So first question is on the keynotes that keeps generating questions. I have to say that I cannot wait for the next Kafka Summit where we have new keynotes with new questions. So Martin Kleppmann did his keynote about reimagining databases as Kafka and Kafka as databases. And Yong Ming Luo uh, had the comment that it seems like many of the properties are achieved by turning synchronous processing to asynchronous. And this is 100% correct. So we took something that was synchronous data uh, process, we split it apart, we turned it asynchronous, we showed how it's still a valid process for the use case, and how you get better decoupling, better scalability, sometimes lower latency. So you get all those nice things by reimagining your architecture from synchronous to asynchronous. So, and the, the entire talk is basically an example of how you can do it while maintaining good properties like atomicity. And now a question from Twitter, um, Baharat Cricket, or something along those lines, sorry for mispronouncing your name, asked, is there a pattern for dependent Kafka streams in microservice architecture? So he has service one processing a record from a topic, and then service two wants to process the same topic, but only run after service one already processed it. So the easy answer for creating this kind of dependency is basically have service one output a message to a different topic saying, hey, I'm done processing this message and post the entire message. And then you have service two basically read from topic two and can process things that it, we know that service one already processed. That's the easiest. I would challenge you as an architect to take it a step further and think, do you really need service two to run after service one if both of them are processing the same records? Is it something that you could actually imagine happening in parallel and not one after another? This will, of course, decouple the two services and make your architecture as a whole more efficient. Not always possible but sometimes it is. Okay, another one of those videos that keeps on giving, KSQL streams and tables from Level Up Your KSQL series. Uh, Simon Archer commented and said, really useful, but I can't get it out of my mind that this guy sounds a bit like Jeff Goldblum. This guy being apparently our friend Tim Berglund. So, I don't know if Jeff Goldblum is the name that comes to mind, but yeah, he definitely has this amazing voice. So yeah, maybe Jeff Goldblum it is. And yes, it is a kind of a, one of those videos that is just fun to listen to. Another one from Twitter, our good friend Rene Kerner responded, and he actually wrote it way back in January, and we kind of dropped the ball on this one a bit. Uh, he actually sent three questions and said, Choose one of, when will Zookeeper be removed? Shh, that's top secret. Uh, have you ever faced issues with annoying JVM DNS cache on cloud or Kubernetes when DNS is the preferred service discovery method? What is the solution? So the answer is, have I ever? Yes, we have escalations with that, we have support against with that, we found bugs with that, and we fixed them. So basically, it used to be that the answer was the JVM has this uh, security property uh, that controls the DNS cache on the JVM. And I'll have the property here in the comments, so you'll be able to just pick it up, copy paste it from here. You set it to something like 60 seconds, and then the DNS cache will refresh every 60 seconds, and you're good to go. But we have a version 
uh, which I believe it is uh, Kafka 210, so Confluent 510, where we had a bug where the lookup doesn't happen correctly. So even though you did everything else correct, you will still run into the DNS caching issue, which is very unfortunate. This was fixed. So we have two fixes to this problem that went in in version 512 of Confluent platform, and I think it's 211 of Apache Kafka. Uh, this is like the most recently released patch set for um, 2.1.0. And this, uh, in this version, you actually get to, um, the, the discovery will actually happen correctly in Kafka and you don't rely on other settings. So this is, uh, this is the version you want to be on if you're on cloud or Kubernetes. In cloud, you have the wor optional workaround of also creating kind of ELBs with external IPs pointing at every broker. So you actually have static IPs and don't depend on those automated uh, IPs that you get via Kubernetes or the cloud. So you have few options there, um, but yes, we have indeed faced them. And then the last question from Rene was, any experience with Kafka on Java 11? Yes, we do it all the time. And the new ZGC, the new garbage collector. And we actually haven't tried the new garbage collection. If you did, anyone at home trying Kafka with the new garbage collector, let us know how it went. Uh, we don't think it will be amazing for Kafka because it's optimized for much larger heaps. It actually has, um, I think it doesn't compress the signifier and it uses uh, 64 bits, which means that you have larger overhead for smaller objects. So we think that it's optimized for a different use case than Kafka. It only makes sense from 32G and up, and most Kafka clusters don't run with that big of a JVM heap anyway. But if you do try and you have cool results, publish them, and I promise to share them here in the podcast. Okay, so that's one of those things I said in previous episodes coming back to bite me moments. Um, Tim Bergland visited some of our friends in uh, North Carolina uh, last week. And I don't know if I'm allowed to share who they are, so I'm kind of keeping it vague. But he came back and said, you know, they asked me, in, ask Confluent 5, you mentioned that there are new metrics to tell us how many clients of which version are connecting to Kafka. Uh, apparently around the 15 <laughs> minute mark. And that's in the GMX. And we tried looking at the GMX documentation, but we didn't find it. Uh, so part of it is on me and part of it is in the Kafka community. The fact that you couldn't find it in the documentation is because sometimes we add features and forget to document them. So we are very sorry, we will fix that problem. Meanwhile, the other reason is that I said that it will tell you how many clients of which versions are connecting, and it doesn't. We actually, so the keep you're looking for is keep 188, which adds metrics for how many requests per second for the different types of Kafka requests come from each version. Uh, actually, no. That's not 100% correct. It adds the number of conversions. So how many fetch conversions per second happen and how many produce conversions. You really want to watch the fetch conversions. Those are the ones that are really painful. And you want it ideally zero. If you have more than zeros, then obviously you have old clients because you're doing conversions. So this is one place to look. I think this is the same keep also adds a metric so you can see the memory used for the conversions. So you can keep an eye on that as well. Now there was a follow-up keep which added tags to the requests. You know how you have the requests per second uh, metric? It adds a tag so you can actually see the version of the request per second. So you're looking at, again, fetch requests. And in this case, you're going to have fetch from replica or fetch from client. You're looking for uh, at fetch requests from clients. And then you'll have a tag for the versions and you can drill into the number of requests per second per client if your JMX browser supports tagging, which ideally it should. So this is what we have. This is what you have in Kafka. There is, I believe, also configuration variable that allows you to control who, uh, whether or not you support the different conversions on specific topics. Uh, that's a bit newer. Anyway, so I'll have those uh, GMX metrics here for in the comments for the podcast, so we won't make the same mistake twice. And we will fix the documentation. 
Okay, and that's one kind of easy question from um, Stack Overflow that I thought was kind of fun. Someone has an object that he wants to send as a message to Kafka. He gave like an employee as an example. And the object is really, really small. And he was worried that if he's going to use a key, well, the key is already part of the object anyway. If he'll use a key, then he's going to just waste some space. So he asked what will happen if I just omit the key from the message. So obviously, oh, and then he had a workaround. Obviously, if you just omit the key, you're not going to know which partition the object is going to. And if you need multiple updates to the same employee with the same ID, you want them in the same partition. So he said, I'll just calculate the partition myself, use the producer API that allows me to write to a specific partition, and then I don't need to write the key, right? Because I'm just, I know that I'm writing to the correct partition. The key is already part of the value anyway. I should be good to go. Uh, so I thought about it because it's interesting. I haven't seen that done before, but theoretically it sounds good. And it turns out that, okay, obviously you cannot do compaction. If you do co compaction, is based on keys. So he loses the ability to compact. And on something like employees, you may actually want to compact. And then you also, you lose the ability to do st things like stream to stream join because that's based on the keys. Uh, so you definitely lose some capabilities, but if you don't need those capabilities, then it's not that bad of an idea either. So that's, um, I like how you kind of write a system and people come up with new ways to use it. So that's pretty cool. And then last thing to round this whole short episode up, um, you probably know that Kafka Summit New York City is coming up on April 2nd. And my friend and friend of the podcast, really, Victor Gamov, did a short video explaining what he's excited about and how awesome it's going to be and kind of giving an intro to the whole event. If you are planning to go, you should watch it so you'll know what to be excited about. If you're not planning to go, you should definitely watch it to know what you're going to miss and maybe change your mind. It's not too late to go anyway. I also wrote some of my favorite sessions on Twitter. I mean, there's going to be so many favorite, amazing sessions there that it's absolutely unbelievable. Like the Tesla talk is probably going to be super exciting. I, I'm curious how they're using Kafka. So, and the keynote uh, by Pivotal is going to be really cool. I'm really excited about that. So there's going to be tons and tons of cool talks, partially from Confluent and partially from the amazing users of Kafka and the community. Maybe some of you are going to be there. Uh, if you show up and you go, you remember a few episodes back, we had Jeston Gustafsson on the show talking about exactly once. Uh, he's going to be there again, talking about exactly once again. Uh, so if you're a fan of the show, you should see the previous episode so you should, you'll know which questions to ask him and then go to his session and tell him how awesome it was to see him at Ask Confluent. I'm sure this will make his day. So, okay, that's it. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Great questions from the community as usual. And thank you for the great feedback. It was awesome. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you here next time. Mm -hmm.